Good afternoon, and welcome to this, the 10th session of the bilingual McGill course commemorating the ILO centenary, uh, Transnational Futures of International Labor Law, La Justice Sociale dans le Monde du Travail. My name is Adele Blackett. I'm Presser of Law and Canada Research Chair in Transnational Labor Law and Development uh, here at McGill University. And this course is sponsored through my 2016 fellowship with the nonpartisan Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. This week, we have the pleasure to address a topic that sheds light on an emerging and important actor in transnational labor law and development, China, and sheds light on alternative dimensions of an emergent transnational labor law. Quite interestingly, both of our speakers, without having been prompted, have decided to focus their reflections on Chinese investments and labor practices in sub-Saharan Africa, a theme that has been th pursued uh, through uh, the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory. Their focus, in large measure, is on Chinese workers posted in the African countries uh, like Guinea Equatorial and Tanzania, where uh, the investment projects take place. And their focus enables this particular session of our Transnational Futures course to look closely at uh, the relationship with other states in the developing world. This gives our course, first and foremost, at, an, at a somewhat basic level, an opportunity to complicate what the characterization of developing country and indeed development sometimes means. Um, second, it gives us a chance to begin to think about labor law's territorial scope. The language of enclaves is explicitly invoked today, and as one ILO report under the Tripartite Declaration on National Enterprises framed it, um, sometimes we're thinking about government of a country within a country. So what are the responsibilities for states that, uh, to attach uh, for setting or enabling or enforcing labor standards in these contexts? And third, this is an opportunity to reflect on an under-researched part of the International Labor Organization's technical cooperation role where the ILO provides assistance on how labor law reform may be reformed or undertaken rather and how uh, at multilateral and bilateral levels one may interrogate uh, international uh, action uh, what the role of norms uh, may be uh, within this context. Uh, and so all of these themes uh, can be explored in our discussion today. Let me also draw uh, your attention to the significance of the theme of resistance, something we'll explore very specifically in our final session of Transnational Futures of International Labor Law, but which also permeates the discussion today and similarly gives us an opportunity to think about labor law as development. So it's my great pleasure to welcome for this discussion today two learned speakers, uh, Dr. Mimi Zhu, Professor Yifeng Chen, and to benefit from the comments of respected colleague and former ILO official, Professor Sean Cooney, as well as uh, McGill teaching fellow C. Chen, who is doing highly original work in this field. I will introduce them in the order in which they will speak. And so first, I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Mimi Zhu uh, of the University of Oxford. She is the inaugural Fangda Career Development Fellow in Chinese Commercial Law at St. Hughes College in association with the Oxford Law Faculty and the Oxford China Center. It's the first post in Chinese law at Oxford. Dr. Ter Zhu has the role of developing the subject as a new field of study and research there, exploring how best to understand Chinese law and the links between law, economy, politics, and society both within China and as it affects transnational relations. Prior to her appointment at Oxford, Dr. Zhu was Edwards Fellow at Columbia Law School, an assistant professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and senior researcher at Utrecht University. Dr. Zhu has also been a visitor at a number of leading Chinese universities and research institutes, including the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, Renmin University, Tsinghua University, Peking University, and uh, several other uh, notable uh, establishments. Alongside academia, she has served as an independent advisor. She's also been a consultant for international organizations and firms in technical and professional services sectors across China, the United States, and Australasia. 
For over 15 years, she has worked in law firms, international organizations, government departments, and financial institutions in Asia Pacific and in Europe. And in 2016, the Asia Society named her an Asia 21 Young Leader. She was a finalist in the British Council's Education UK Alumni Awards and Young Australian of the Year Awards. And she has equally been a consultant for the International Labour Organization's Beijing office for 12 years. So we're very grateful to have you here. The title of Dr. Zhu's presentation is China's Belt and Road Initiative, Transnational Labour Law Under State Capitalism 4.0. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to first thank um, Professor Blackett for the very kind in invitation to um, leave um, my current country uh, in a very distressful state of affairs. Um, there's a Chinese saying that um, it's better to be a dog in peaceful times than a human in chaotic times. And indeed, um, Right now, I, I am indeed very grateful to be at McGill University in Canada. It seems like a world away from the chaos that uh, uh, my uh, current country in the UK is uh, experiencing. So thinking back to also a chaotic time was about 10 years ago when I was a junior lawyer. Um, for some of you, that could be next year. Um, the world was at a very interesting moment in history. Um, so I'd finished law school, I started a job um, in a big UK law firm. Um, I found myself in Canary Wharf, which is uh, where the banking uh, district is in London. I found myself in the old building of Lehman Brothers. Now some of you are uh, very, very young <laughs> indeed, so you may not have remembered that moment very clearly but I was um, with a big firm that had Lehman as one of our top clients, and I found myself as a, a junior associate dealing with the mess of the global financial crisis. It was quite a morally challenging moment uh, as I really thought about how did this come about, um, and how, did, how were lawyers responsible, actually. Um, but it also made me, I was definitely much more to the left back then, uh, even though I went into a career in corporate law, but of course I've left that now. Um, I was really thinking about how the, how, how, how the, how the liberal markets of, of the world came to this point in the global financial crisis. Um, as I went to China the following year, as part of work, um, I also saw a very different picture, but one obviously that also recognised China's position in the global economy. I saw a picture that was very much, very much state heavy. The government had just pumped in, the Chinese government had just pumped in um, trillions of uh, renminbi, uh, about 600 US um, dollars, six, sorry, 600 billion US dollars of stimulus package into the economy. And shortly after, the economy actually went like this. So I was, I found myself in southern China where there were a lot of worker activities in terms of collective disputes, um, wages were going up, and I was contrasting this with what, what was happening in North America and Europe. Uh, China was achieving growth in 2010 at 12%, whereas the rest of the um, Western developed world was uh, barely managing um, any sort of positive growth. And so this was the contrast that really made me think about uh, the idea of state capitalism. And this is, uh, those of you who've read my paper today, um, that's sort of the theoretical framework through which I want to explore um, some of the transnational labour issues that arise from China's increasing engagement with the setting of international standards and norms, um, and particularly in, in the context of um, the IOO standards. So I think those of us who, who can remember the 2008-2009 financial crisis, um, we have been questioning about sort of the 
predominant modes of capitalism um, that uh, have kind of prevailed since the 80s and that have underpinned the sort of major global economic policies such as the Washington Consensus um, that have been promoted for the past few decades. Um, US-led, that's for sure, um, up until this point. So we know that the free market ideology that has largely underlied um, the Washington Consensus has favored deregulation, privatization, and the withdrawal of the state from the market. The idea is that market forces would drive these um, developing economies uh, to more efficient outcomes that will lead to growth and improved living standards. Now, that's sort of been the predominant kind of law and development thinking underpinning um, the Washington Consensus. I think the global financial crisis really has made us rethink this predominant ideology over the past decade. Um, we have seen, obviously, um, the huge rescue packages that came to big banks and big private companies that were deemed too big to fail by the US government. I think that dented significantly the sort of supremacy of neoliberal thinking uh, underpinning the global economic order. Uh, now, Noam Chomsky described this um, US government kind of absorption of the systemic risks and moral hazards posed by corporate America as a new stage of state capitalism. So at the same time, what we've been seeing is a shift, obviously, in geopolitics. And many, of, many parts of the world thinking, questioning US-led economic order and also pondering whether perhaps the Chinese model of development based on state capitalism, its own version of state capitalism, is perhaps a better alternative. So it's been termed the Beijing consensus or the Chinese model. What happened, as I explained, in China was the mobilization of the state sector during the financial crisis. And that's, that's been a remaining force. The state's intervention in the economy has been a concurring theme throughout China's development trajectory. And I argue in this paper that it's not going to dissipate anytime soon and has evolved to what I call state capitalism 4.0. And I'm going to elaborate uh, what that concept, what I mean by this concept shortly. But I think in terms of the context of um, this course, and as Professor Blackard said earlier, uh, you know, what does this mean about sort of the debates of law and development and labor law? Now, the free market neoliberal thinking has always sort of posed labor law um, as this, you know, market distorting mechanism. Um, we, we see that even the World Bank um, doing business report has indeed quoted, uh, as, as I quote the report, has indeed said um, actually these labor standards can hurt workers themselves. So there's been this view among some institutional economists that the role of a legal system in development is to provide secure and stable property and contract rights. Labor law, labor standards, labor and social rights were seen as hostile to this idea of um, law and development. So I've argued elsewhere against these conventional argument, uh, uh, conventional views of law and development. Uh, I developed this uh, idea of social rights hypothesis to describe in the context of China how the Chinese party states has used social rights, for example, labor rights, um, to support um, the marketization of the Chinese economy to correct the market failures and to also limit the social, uh, socially destabilizing effects of market reform. So this is building up this idea of capital state capitalism 4.0 builds on this um, idea um, that the Chinese party state's influence, not just in the domestic economy, but the global economy and the transnational labor market, the focus of, of this paper, um, is very significant and an alternative 
uh, perhaps not an alternative for all countries, but it's certainly posing itself as an alternative to the Western-led, US-led um, global economic order that has prevailed over the past few decades. So what do I mean by state capitalism 4.0? Now, I think when we think about state capitalism, much of the literature has looked at sort of the cultivation of state-owned enterprises. Yes, China has um, uh, very powerful state-owned enterprises, and indeed it has been, it has been fostering these state-owned enterprises in strategic areas um, to become global champions uh, in those sectors. So, State capitalism incorporates this cultivation and dominance of state-owned enterprises. But at the same time, there is more to that. Um, so um, another aspect of state capitalism we can think about in the Chinese context is about how the state also uh, allocates uh, various types of resources to private companies in specific sectors that has very strong connections to the state. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Huawei. It is one of those companies that I know in the Canadian uh, scene is very, uh, hits the headlines. They're obviously aimed at challenging foreign rivals for dominance in the global market. So this is another aspect of the state capitalism as we see in the Chinese context. Again, the cultivation of state enterprises backing of strategic private firms, this is not new to China. So there are other countries that practices these models of state capitalism. Now, my um, concept of state capitalism tries to capture a few more distinctive Chinese characteristics, uh, which you may argue may be found in other economies, uh, but I think in terms of China, these characteristics are uh, fairly uh, significant. So first of all, I believe that this form of state capitalism also captures the way that Chinese state exerts influence on the operating environments of Chinese firms abroad. Okay, so there's, there's not many um, instances where you can say, oh, there's, there's a country that is actually trying to influence the operating environments of uh, the host states in which China's political interest are, um, are being uh, exercised. Now, these, uh, the sectors in which this um, state influence is particularly um, significant involve firms, Chinese firms, that are state-owned, state-invested, or state-connected. And what's unique, I think, about this aspect of state capitalism 4.0 is that the government is in a very hands-on role uh, with respect to organizing state capital and state uh, labor flows to these countries, and notably developing countries. And my, my colleague, Professor Chen, will talk a bit more about um, the Chinese labor in Africa. I touch on it in my paper, but I really want to lay out this framework to analyze this mobilization of transnational labor to developing countries as part of um, China's state capitalism 4.0. Because it involves Beijing also leveraging its political capital associated with diplomatic relationships, as well as economic and financial support to these countries. Okay, so we often hear in the context of Belt and Road countries that these host countries are indebted to um, Chinese investments. So we see also that China has its own agenda, which fits in with a lot of these host countries' own development industrialization strategy. And hence the question for, for, for us is actually whether Chinese model of state capitalism 4.0 is going to have influence um, on these countries' labor, domestic labor systems and transnational uh, labor systems. I don't give an answer today, but I certainly uh, look forward to discussions um, on this particular question. Secondly, as part of state capitalism 4.0, I think it incorporates a very strong element of party capitalism. Okay, so um, the Chinese Communist Party is the vanguard of Chinese political order. So it has to be a central actor in state capitalism 
So the Chinese Communist Party has had a long-standing role in terms of the evolution of state-owned enterprises. Um, it manages still, it has a direct involvement in the management of state-owned enterprises. Uh, so the Chinese Communist Party appoints essentially the exe senior executives of the state-owned enterprises. Um, and in, in recent times, under the Xi, uh, President Xi's administration, amendments to the party constitution has meant that actually the party committee, for example, in state-owned enterprises must be consulted on major issues. Now, private firms, and I'm happy to talk more about this in Q&A uh, due to the limitations of time, private firms have also uh, been roped into an increasing dominance of the party in corporate life. And so what we're seeing is in state capitalism 4.0, in the Chinese context, the party plays the pivotal role. Um, in the, uh, in the context of Belt and Road projects, but also um, the, as I've said, domestically, um, it is at the apex of um, corporate China, or some people call it China Inc. Now, thirdly, state capitalism 4.0 in the backdrop of rapid technological advancement and China's desire to be a global leader in new areas such as artificial intelligence State capitalism 4.0 encompasses the state's strategic exploitation of science and technological innovations uh, through a network of very complex relationships with state-owned enterprises and private firms in the tech sector. Now, the party, again, I have to emphasize, is, is very crucial um, to creating the political conditions in which Beijing can actually do this. Um, and we know that President Xi Jinping's aspiration for the Chinese economy to um, become, um, for China to become the superpower in tech and innovation means that um, this aspect of state capitalism 4.0 will continue to see the rise of national and international champions, um, Chinese state-owned and private firms um, in this sector that has very close connections with Beijing. So, um, so these are the three aspects, I think, that are on top of um, what has been traditionally characterized as state capitalism. And now I want to turn to how they play out specifically in the Belt and Road Initiative. So most of us have probably read about the Belt and Road. I don't want to go too much into this particular um, grand initiative, also because uh, it's also a very malleable term. Um, there's a lot of times you hear about Belt and Road projects, uh, but um, it might actually not be linked to an infrastructure project. I've been to many Belt and Road forums on all aspects of, um, from you know, um, uh, the Belt and Road, um, something to do with funds to um, Belt and Road legal disputes. So there's a lot of, this space is, is quite, um, is quite saturated at the moment. But when we look at the core of the Belt and Road, it really is about massive infrastructure projects um, along these two kind of Silk Road economic belt and the 21st century maritime Silk Road. So um, what's very interesting about the core projects, the core Belt and Road infrastructure projects, is that they're tied to also the host country's um, economic development and industrialization strategy. So here it's another very interesting kind of component that Belt and Road um, is, you know, part of President Xi Jinping's kind of grand narrative of China's involvement in the development of the world. Um, of course, China has its own interest with the Belt and Road projects. Um, but what, what's been very controversial from a labor perspective um, have been the labor practices that have arisen from the Belt and Road um, projects um, that uh, have caused quite a lot of concern, particularly in countries that are called weak governance zones. So these are countries where governments are unable or unwilling to assume, uh, for example, human rights responsibilities. So there's been a lot of um, countries in the Belt and Road that could be called weak governance zones. And certainly, um, you know, my, my friend will talk a bit more about Africa, uh, Chinese investments in Africa. Um, What's interesting about 
these massive infrastructure projects has been indeed the mobilization of Chinese labor. So um, a distinct feature of state capitalism 4.0, as I've described, has been the involvement of Beijing's, Beijing in these development projects, these massive infrastructure projects, uh, through the state-owned enterprises and other state-connected firms. Now, the um, Chinese government itself has also urged its own firms, Chinese firms in certain sectors, uh, to continue expanding out of China uh, as part of an active employment policy. Because, as, for example, in the coal and steel industries, overcapacity and overstaffing. So it's a deliberate strategy on the part of the government also to see Chinese labor from certain sectors uh, that are experiencing, experiencing overcapacity back home. And the employment, that, that's the very interesting aspect is that you know, the employment, these workers still need a job, but you're not going to be easily turning a 50-year-old coal miner into, say, Uber driver, although I have met a few um, Uber drivers in China that were from uh, formerly state mine, mining companies. Um, so it's this idea of also using Belt and Road projects to create employment for Chinese workers. Um, this has been, of course, very controversial because, let's face it, if you're a Belt and Road country, um, you, you want to use these projects to generate local employment. So that's been a very um, uh, contested aspect of Chinese outbound investments um, in terms of the, uh, the question of how much local employment that actually generates. China has about over a million um, Chinese workers dispatched abroad uh, over the, since 2014. So, um, my, the next speaker will talk a bit more about the dispatch um, arrangements, but a lot of times these workers are being sent over by these dispatch agencies. And it's not too clear um, what legal regimes actually apply with respect to their um, labor, with respect to labor protections. So um, what we see that actually sometimes in Africa and Southeast Asia, in a lot of these construction projects, the engagement of these Chinese workers are actually specified in the um, bidding contracts. Um, and that's why the, the bids, the bid prices are so low um, that have been put forward by Chinese firms. Um, these workers are also constrained in terms of their labor mobility through specific immigration um, and employment arrangements. Um, there's been already significant numbers of labor disputes involving these workers, Chinese workers that the government, the Chinese government, has had to intervene. Um, again, I, I, yeah, I, I'll leave the examples um, to, to my friend after me, um, but um, let's just say that the government has, the Chinese government has explicitly acknowledged uh, the need to handle a, a number of major labor disputes in foreign countries, uh, such as Angola, in the past decade, uh, where it has had uh, a lot of issues. Uh, sometimes very violent labor disputes that have occurred. The other area that um, I find very interesting and um, eliminates perhaps the idea of state capitalism 4.0 is the idea of corporate social responsibility with Chinese characteristics. So um, China knows that there's a lot of negative image associated with these controversies. Um, involving labor disputes abroad, involving accusations that Chinese firms have um, lower um, work and safety standards than, say, other foreign firms. And so it has actually um, placed a lot of emphasis in the past, over the past decade on the development of this discourse around corporate social responsibility in the context of Chinese firms going abroad. Uh, much more so than any other country, um, uh, especially Western countries that we, we know, directing firms uh, to, do, to be, do the right thing. Um, but this is a very different discourse from business and human rights. Uh, for the interest of time, I don't have much, uh, I, I can't really elaborate on the main differences. But let's just say it's the state that basically says, okay, state-owned enterprises, you go to Tanzania, you must develop these mechanisms of corporate social responsibility. Uh, of course, this idea of corporate social responsibility usually means giving money to local schools. Um, you know, um, also, um, uh, you know, it's not 
while you talk about the environment, it, it's not really, a, from the reports that I've seen of Chinese companies, um, it's, it's much, it's a very superficial level, their engagement with much more complex issues like stakeholder engagement, environmental and labour protections. For, for the Chinese companies, CSR, you know, in, say, Africa is still about giving money or volunteers, um, you know, Chinese workers going to um, uh, local schools, teaching them how to write uh, Chinese calligraphy. So, um, so there, there is a bit of a gap between what the government wants, the state, the party state, directing these companies to be socially um, responsible and actually what happens on the ground. But essentially you can see the sort of state-centred, top-down approach uh, of state capitalism 4.0 in this sphere uh, by just looking at the regulations and the policy documents that the government has produced in this area. Uh, but again, you know, the policies may look good on paper, but in practice it, it paints a different picture. So. Um, I think to wrap up, um, just to kind of go back to some of the themes of this course and uh, some of the questions posed by Professor Blackcoat earlier on, um, I think we are all quite aware of Beijing's ambitions to expand its um, global influence through the Belt and Road um, and other projects. Um, we, suddenly in this country and, and um, in a, your, the country down south, uh, we, we are wary of um, Beijing's um, ambition also to have a more prominent role in shaping the rules of the game in international economic, political and legal orders. From the fourth plenary session of the 18th Central Committee meeting, the Communist Party of China stated its desire for China to vigorously participate in the formulation of international norms and strengthen the country's discourse power and influence in international legal affairs. Now, I think this raises an interesting question about what sort of international legal norms China is seeking to influence and how state capitalism 4.0 will play out in this particular sphere. We, we know that there's been a lot of reports about bad labor practices and standards by Chinese firms in um, a, new, a number of Belt and Road countries. Um, is this going to be a race to the bottom? Or as I've put it somewhere, perhaps state capitalism 4.0 may work its magic and the government, uh, Beijing, will direct these firms to be good corporate citizens abroad therefore challenging perhaps some of the neoliberal thinking around labor standards, transnational labor standards, and actually uphold or even promote higher standards and what I call um, a, um, the, the road, taking the high road, playing with the Belt and Road um, uh, metaphor. So um, I think it will be very interesting to see how the Chinese party state under capital, state capitalism 4.0 influences its state-owned enterprises as well as private firms in engaging with defining and implementing international labor standards and norms. Will they become, will these Chinese firms become new standard makers, particularly in the context of the Belt and Road Initiative? So I think this question is a very important one and one that needs further empirical research, one that I hope students here uh, with an interest in China and, and Chinese labor law uh, will take up. Uh, but I do hope that today um, the very rough and uh, in early stage development um, framework of state capitalism 4.0 provides uh, a somewhat useful um, analytical framework for such future research. So thank you very much indeed for having me here. Thank you very much, Dr. Zhu, for setting out such a clear and helpful framework. Our second speaker is Professor Yifeng Cheng, and he is an associate professor at the Peking University Law School and an assistant director of the Peking University Institute of International Law.
Before joining Peking University, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Helsinki from 2010 to 2013, and he continues to serve as a docent in international law there. He was a visiting scholar uh, to the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law, the Lauterpacht Center for International Law at the University of Cambridge, Stockholm Center for International Law and Justice, the Norwegian Center for Human Rights, and others. He worked as Senior Research Fellow at the Academy of Finland Research Project on the Implementation of Core Labor Standards in China, the Legal Architecture and Cultural Logic, and that from 2012 to 2015. He has worked extensively on the history of labor and social laws in the Republic of China and uh, the ILO, including much of the ILO's early history um, in uh, establishing offices abroad, and his fields of interest include international law, international organizations, global governance, and international and comparative labor law. So uh, we're very pleased to have you here, Professor Chen. You're, the title of his presentation is Enclave Governance and Transnational Labor Law, a Case Study of Chinese Workers on Strike in Africa. Thank you very much, Professor Chen. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Blackett. Uh, thank you for organizing this seminar on China and International Labor Law. Uh, it is really time to examine and reflect how China might contribute to or actually have affected the recognition and the enforcement of labor rights at a globalized context. I also would like to thank Dr. Mimi Zhou, Professor Xian Kuni, and uh, Ms. Chen for joining uh, this session, a wonderful occasion for intellectual exchange for such a, uh, such an interesting topic. Today, I would like to divide my presentation into three parts. In the first part, I would like to over a quick overview of how the Chinese engagement with the labor protection and labor rights in international and transnational settings. In the second part, I shall present my case study of the posted Chinese workers striking in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, to highlight the uncertainty and vulnerability that transnationally posted workers face in terms of labor rights protection. And finally, by way of conclusion, I'd like to share some personal thoughts as to how China might positively contribute to development of the labor rights recognition at a global level. So my, I shall start briefly reflect upon how China uh, might be relevant to the transnational labor protection. Of course, we have witnessed the rapid economic growth of China in economic term. And China has become the second largest outflowing country for foreign direct investment. And we have many Chinese companies going abroad. And we also have many Chinese workers working abroad. And China is now advocating its One Belt, One Road initiative, as Mibito has brilliantly mentioned. And China has been also very active with ILO and with many international financial institutions in elaborating relevant labor standards. Of course, we should not overlook that labor development, labor law development within China, and it will be very interesting actually to examine how that labor law in China also affected its enterprises globally, and how the Chinese labor law might also affect the labor law in other countries. The Chinese labor law development occurred mostly after the reform that opening up in late 1990, and late 1970s. And the labor law has, was developed largely in a response to the requirement to establish a market economy in China. And of course, it is also a need to protect the rights and interests of workers. And also to respond to the demand for social stability in China. Therefore, we see the enactment of the 
labor law in 1994, the law on the trade union in 1992, and the enactment of labor contract law, the labor em employment promotion law, and the labor dispute mediation and arbitration law all in, in 2007. We have observed a state-centered, top-down approach in elaborating and developing labor law in China. And we also see that labor law has been seen largely as an institution essential for an operational market, market economy. And we also see much emphasis has been placed on individual labor standards, less on collective rights, such as trade, such as the right to trade union and collective bargaining. And this, also, this strong state intervention also results to a relatively high rigidity of the labor regulation and the strong labor protection in China. According to re most recent OECD indicators of employment protection, the protection of uh, permanent workers against individual and collective dismissals in China by the year of 2012 is graded as 3.1, much higher than many developed countries, like Canada, which was ranked 1.51, Finland 2.17, and Germany 2.84. So the labor regulation in China has been particularly strong in a sense. And China has also been very actively engaging in labor protection. China is the original member of the ILO. China has ratified 26 labor com international labor conventions. This, including, this includes two, uh, this includes four fundamental conventions out of eight, and the two governance conventions out of four, and uh, another 20 technical conventions. China has not ratified the two labor fundamental conventions related to freedom of association and the protection of the right to uh, collective bargaining. And China has also refrained from joining the two conventions concerned forced labor uh, issue. Outside of the ILO framework, China is also engaging labor rights and labor protection in other settings. For example, China has now signed more than 10 uh, free trade agreements, out of which five has a very brief reference to labor protection. The strongest reference to labor pr protection was the agreement, free trade arrangement between China and New Zealand. And uh, according to that free trade arrangement, a memorandum of understanding on labor, on labor cooperation between Chinese government and New Zealand government was made. And in that memorandum of understanding, both parties affirm their obligation as members of the ILO, including their commitment and the ILO declaration on fundamental principles and rights at work and its follow-up. And they also recognize that it is inappropriate to use labor law, regulations, or policies for trade protectionist purpose. But they also recognize that it, they should not encourage trade or investment by weakening the protection offered in domestic labor laws and regulations. And in recent negotiation between China and Canada on the free trade arrangement, the labor issue is again a very heated debate issue between two governments. No detail the report has been revealed, but this is reported to be one of the obstacles for the two governments to conclude a free trade agreement. And in the setting of investment treaties, China and the EU have been talking about have been talking about the possibility of conclusion of a bilateral investment agreement for several years. And in the talk organized in December last year, the issue on the sustainable development was mentioned. And in that context, labor and environmental protection was mentioned. But by far, no single investment treaty made by China has included a labor provision. So there are some 
I could, I could give a summary of some key features for China's engagement with transnational or international labor protection. First of all, the labor protection is primarily seen as domestic or territorialized issue, namely falling within responsibility of the country where the workers perform their duties. And there's strong resistance to international intervention through trade measures or other related measures. And China is not keen to export its labor standards either. The second feature is, has been the incremental approach to labor protection. And labor protection is often characterized by China as non-trade factors in trade or investment negotiations. Thirdly, I think China is also very, also takes a promotional approach to labor protection instead of a very hardcore normative approach to set out or elaborating detailed labor standards. And lastly, I think China's support for a dialogic approach rather than a punitive measures or to settle this labor disputes through formalized legal mechanisms. So in this context, I would like to present my case study on the Chinese workers striking in Equatorial Guinea. So I think I would like to, I think I need to explain a bit why I have taken this cases. It is a case about Chinese workers working with Chinese company. They are construction workers. So there's no involvement of African workers or foreign companies. It is a very uh, relatively simple structure when it comes to transnational labor regulation. Yet it is also reveals that could be very complicated issue when it comes to practice. And uh, this case has been widely reported after the strike led two Chinese workers dead and some other injured. And this is also partly related to my interest in as a political interest and due to the availability of information. And this case is of course highly representative in several regards. I would very briefly present the facts and the concerned labor rights. So a Chinese company named Jianyu Overseas Development Company is a subcontract for a housing program in Guinea, in Equatorial Guinea. And it has recruited about 350 workers from China. And this this group of workers consists of two different groups. One group from Shandong Weihai, where the company was established. And another hundred workers from Donghai County of Jiangsu province, a neighboring province. And these workers signed a contract with this company. And in that contract, it is agreed that these workers would perform their work and they would, uh, they would receive a minimum monthly pay of $540 per month. And this is a fixed term contract for two years. And when it comes to practice, the, the employer tried to withhold certain amount, or more than half of the salary from the workers. And this becomes an issue when the exchange rate of the US dollar against Chinese yuan had dramatically dropped almost 9% within a year's period. As the US dollar was the agreed currency for the payment, the workers were very concerned with the shrinking of their income. So they immediately approached the management and asked for the payment for their work. But the management did not respond very appropriately. And instead, there was 
clash between the workers and management. And the management tried to involve local police to suppress the workers' strike and stoppage. And they claim that this is illegal under the law of Equatorial Guinea. And uh, the, stat, the policeman start to arrest workers when the workers start to engage for second uh, stoppage. And there was some physical and violent contact between the workers and the police. And eventually, the police started to, to shoot at the workers. Two Chinese workers were killed and another four injured. And the rest of the workers were taken into custody. This was the event happened in 2007, March 21st. The Chinese government and its embassy in Equatorial Guinea quickly responded. The Chinese government urged the Guinean government to contact to conduct a thorough investigation. And the embassy officials also visited Chinese workers. And in another one and a half months, all the Chinese workers were sent back to China. And this put an end to the conflict. And this was, of course, a tragedy. However, a lot of issues was involved. First of all, the right to remuneration to be paid fully and timely was definitely violated. And the employer has, had also illegally taken performance deposit from the workers. And health and safety at work was also an issue. It, has, it was revealed that workers have constantly suffered from the disease of malaria and neither employer or the employment immunity had fully disclosed that risk to workers. And no effective preventive measures had been implemented at the construction site. And the collective, and the collective labor rights, such as participation in the decision making and the right to organize and the right to collective bargaining was also denied. So this comes to the, so this relates to the, my, my investigation that would this constitute an enclave for a legal vacuum. It is of course useful to understand the living and working space of those transnationally posted workers as an enclave. They stayed in dormitories provided by the construction company and this kind of dormitory is often made of recycled materials, are built next to the construction site. And there, very few of them would go outside the wall and to have a social life there. And neither the law of uh, Equatorial Guinea was fully informed there, within the enclave. And the Chinese law is largely outside of the scene. So as a consequence, the enclave organized itself largely as a self-constituting semi-autonomous community with its own hierarchy, authority, governance structure, language, and social life. And in such circumstances, management has strong presence in the enclave and it may transform that into a strong governor position and whose factual authority over workers is not limited to work-related matters based on contract, but rather more comprehensive, deriving from power to administrating the territory of the enclave. So in this scenario, the rights of the posted workers are uncertain and vague. Which law would have governed the rights of the workers? Chinese law or law of the Equatorial Guinea or a mixture? What would have been the relevance of international labor conventions that China and Equatorial Guinea has both accepted? And this contestation or connection between the Chinese law and the law of the Equatorial Guinea has been mostly visible as to the right to strike. In the current case, 
the issue of right to strike is a very interesting and relevant example. The 1991 Constitution of the Equatorial Guinea in Article 10 recognized right, workers' right to strike, but by qualifying its exercise in accordance with the law. Yet the implementation law was never enacted, and its labor code of 1990, as applied by that time to the clash, was silent on the matter of strike. Neither re authorization nor regulation was provided. And that country has been ruled author authoritatively by its president since 1979. And the government has adopted a relatively suppressive policy against strikes. In China, the issue of strike is deregulated. Chinese labor law is also silent on the matter of the right to strike. The right to, the right to strike is not legally authorized and yet not legally prohibited either. And as the law does not stipulate any procedure requirement for the exercise of strike, no legal sanctions existed against strikers except in case of purposeful destruction of properties. In practice, strike has been resorted by workers rather often in industrial relations. And uh, this practice has been largely tolerated by authority in practice. When the strike happened in Equatorial Guinea, it is very natural that the Chinese workers try to invoke the right to strike as a, as a natural law or as a law of person. Yet this was not recognized and it was challenged and, and contained by the local police. And the selective introduction of local law by the management to challenge workers' rights was characterized as a mean of suppression by the workers. And this has been a very important factor for escalating the conflict. And this is not an isolated case when it comes to Chinese workers strike, in abro strike abroad. There have been reported several cases. And currently, China has almost 1 million overseas workers, and about two, 230 of them working on Chinese uh, international projects. And in such case, those workers remain employees of Chinese companies. So there have been different ways to respond to this kind of situation. The first way of regulatory efforts is to is a unilateral regulatory efforts by Chinese law. This is exactly what the Chinese government tried to do. And this and in 2006, a comprehensive regulation on cross-border posting of workers was promulgated by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. And four specific measures were put into practice, put into effect for the purpose of strengthening the protection of posted workers. The first principle is, the, is to impose a prohibition of outsourcing manpowers. The general contract may subcontract the project as a whole to as subcontractors, but the workers are, are to be part of the projects, and they are not to sign. In, they are not to be subcontracted independently, and they should sign employment contract directly with the general contract or subcontractors. Secondly, a reserve fund for international labor cooperation was extended to cover posted workers. General contractors and subcontractors are required to pay that, pay to that reserve fund. And thirdly, a more intervening approach was taken towards the conclusion of labor contract between the employers and the workers. It is required that the conclusion of a labor contract shall stipulate on issues including work assignment, place of work, duration of the contract, 
remuneration, working days and hours, costs of international flights, local transportation, holidays and rest, overtime pay, working conditions, labor protections, medical and social insurance, and etc. This has been a very comprehensive list for the employment contract. And finally, that regulation also requires that in the case of labor disputes or incidents, that the embassies and consulates of China shall work promptly and appropriately to protect the interests and rights of the workers. And the Chinese company should not abstract workers from appealing to Chinese embassy and consulates about their griefs and concerns. And the incidents in Equatoria, Guinea also lead to a quick reinforcement of the regulation of the posted workers. Especially, it was made clear that the, they should adopt a fixed exchange rate or other measures to ensure the workers' actual income in Chinese yuan. However, these efforts have its limitations. And even in that regulation, Chinese government tried to acknowledge the relevance of the law of the host countries. And it is emphasized in that ministry rule that the contracts are, allow, are required to sign labor contract with the post workers in accordance with the labor law of the host countries, as well as relevant Chinese law and regulations. The labor law of the host countries was expressed acknowledged to have an informal role in, de in designing the and advising the conclusion of and implementation of the labor contract. And another limitation is that the enforcement of Chinese regulation has been carried out largely through voluntary, educational, or mediatory measures. It cannot force the companies in, different, in many cases. And the second approach to this would be a conflict of law approach to conceive this as an issue of, for the conflict of law. But it also has its own limits in this scenario. Conflict of law is usually resort, resort to only if a domestic court of the host state is effectively seized of the case. And if the party of a dispute is purely contract nature between a Chinese worker and a Chinese company, it is possible that a court could excuse it itself as a court of inconvenience. And more problematic, the conflicts of law approach split the labor contract from the collective labor law. The principle governing the labor choice of law for labor contract is separated and different from those applicable to collective labor law issues. And the conflict of law approach also underappreciates the scale of complexity of the legal conflicts brought with enclave governance. The internal disorder on the construction site could spear out the wars and bring about a direct contestation between Chinese labor law and the labor law of Equatorial Guinea. And a third way of response is to look at the self-regulatory approach by the company through the lens of corporate social responsibility. And indeed, in 2012, the Chinese International Contract Association promulgated a guide to social responsibility for Chinese international contractors. And in that guide, it sets very comprehensively the labor rights for workers including both Chinese workers and foreign workers. And in, this, in the current case, definitely this guide has not been playing any useful role. And in the, the fourth approach to this, to, in responding to this situation is related to internal labor law. And the, Equatorial Guinea has ratified all eight fundamental conventions and it has ratified altogether 14, uh, 14 labor conventions. And very interestingly, all out of five, eight fundamental conventions, five of them were 
actually accepted in the year of 2001, very likely to a result of the fundamental labor convention movement advocated by the international labor organization. Conventions are made and accepted, but they are not implemented effectively. This is very similar to the case in China. When the labor conventions, they are accepted by the Chinese, parli Chinese parliament, their implementation still requires a transformative legislations in order to make those international conventions relevant. So all these approaches have their difficulties and problems. So now I, know, I know I have like less than two minutes, so I briefly come to my conclusions. So is there a possibility for China to be transformed into a leading power advocating for strong labor protection at a global level? There are definitely obstacles. There's an ideological problem. Labor is seen largely as territorial sovereign issue instead of national, international or global issue. And there's also policy concern that China still stick its non-intervention policy in many regards. And there's also normative issue. In China, labor rights have been primarily focused on individual labor standards rather than political collective labor rights. And there are also regulatory obstacles, as seen in the case. The protection of posted workers has been resting with the authority for the MOFCOM, the Ministry of Foreign Trade. And the protection of labor force within China has been resting with the Ministry for Human Resources and Social Security. So there's a division of labor between those two institutions. And there's also involvement of foreign ministry and other ministries when it comes to actual dealing with labor disputes. And there's also a practical problem. Many Chinese companies also lack of experience for handling international employment. So there are actual concerns, but there's also increasing need seen by the Chinese authorities and Chinese companies. And there are also certain advantages that China should take from. For example, the labor protection level in China isn't that low. And China has much experience in engaged in labor legislation. And China also faces the increasingly genuine need to protect its foreign investment through labor protection. So it's, there are a lot of potential. But what could be clearly seen is that it's not going to be a confrontational or hard dispute settlement mechanism type. So I think this brings a very important research agenda for the issue of transnational labor law. It is not only about how Chinese company might be able to enforce or implement labor convention labor rights, but it could also be relevant to how different concepts of labor law has been contested in a specific case and in a specific context, and how the Chinese law and practice might change or reveal different understanding on certain particular labor rights and labor issues. And of course, I think this would be a very dynamic process in which both Chinese practice and Chinese law be relevant, but also laws for internet from the international labor organizations and laws from foreign countries are also deeply per pertinent. So I shall stop here, and uh, I will welcome more questions and uh, reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Chen, for that uh, very thoughtful uh, and informative presentation. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Sean Cooney of the University of Melbourne, who will be one of our two commentators today. Professor Cooney's research interests concern international and comparative labor and employment law with a focus on Asia. <clears throat> 
He has worked on new approaches to improving international working standards, including on Australian Research Council funded collaborative projects on Chinese labour law reform, enforcement in Australia itself and assessing the effects of legal change in several Asia-Pacific countries. Uh, Professor Cooney has published widely in major refereed law journals in the United States, China, and Australia. Between 2014 and 2016, he served as a legal specialist in the Labor Law and Reform Unit at the International Labor Organization's Permanent Secretariat in Geneva, where he provided advice to governments in countries that included China, India, Myanmar, and Pakistan. And he continues his consultative work with the ILO. Professor Cooney speaks several languages, including Mandarin, French, and German. He studied at the University of Melbourne and at Columbia University, and he has practiced labor law and administrative law for many years as well. So welcome, Professor Cooney. Um, you might tell us what time it is there <laughs> <That's you laughs> as well, but we want to thank you for being up and uh, ready to comment. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you all hear me? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Blackett. And uh, oh, I'm glad I can see you. I couldn't see you before. And the time in Melbourne is 7:45 a.m. Okay. Uh, on Friday, so I'm speaking to you from the future. <laughs> um, and, uh, so, uh, hello to all of you, bonjour à tous et à tous, and I hope um, I can make some comments on what's, um, what's just been said. Um, so, both papers um, raise the issue of the influence of Chinese approaches to labour law uh, internationally by way of the Belt and Road initiatives or through other investments, uh, and there's a particular focus on Africa. So. Uh, one of the important ideas that uh, Professor Chen's just talked about is this uh, notion of the uh, legal vacuum uh, enclave. So the creation of uh, little sort of carve-outs in countries which are beyond the effective reach of uh, both Chinese and domestic labour law. And they're beyond the reach of Chinese uh, labour law because that law doesn't have extraterritorial effect, at least not in a hard sense. Uh, and on the other hand, the host country, in this case um, Equatorial Guinea, is not um, in a position to direct its resources involving foreign workers separated from the rest of the workforce. How's the um, sound going, OK? Yes, everything's good. Okay. All right. So um, one first point to make about that phenomenon is that it's a very long-standing one and the, it, it is reminiscent of the, the idea of the company towns that developed in many countries in the 19th century where, it, in fact, the regulatory power is the corporation itself uh, that can, you know, it's omnipresent and all-encompassing and it's not limited by either state or worker uh, state authority or worker organisations. However, um, behind this company town or the, on the, the legal vacuum enclave, um, you know, the, the state uh, does appear and as Professor Chen uh, points out that when the workers within the enclave did try to organise and resist, then um, the enclave actually becomes permeable and uh, state armed forces intervene. And that pattern has, you know, is not something that's new. It's been repeated many times in the history of industrialization, uh, commonly in the use of economic zones or industry-specific legislation, uh, often at the behest of foreign investors. So you see that, for example, in the work um, in the 80s, um, um, of um, Suresh Kurovilla in relation to um, uh, Malaysia, for example, Stephen Frankel, Frederick Dale, a lot of uh, developing Asian countries at that time, that pattern emerged. 
Now, um, China, uh, as we said, has not attempted to respond to abuses through extraterritorial legislation. It's used soft law, uh, soft, um, law. and uh, both uh, Professor So and, and, and uh, Chen refer to those efforts by government agencies within China to uh, either try to regulate the contracting arrangements in China itself and then uh, project corporate social responsibility initiatives or other voluntary educational um, initiatives. And both our authors point to the limitations of soft law. And in that longer paper, um, Professor Chen proposes a strengthening of, of transnational labour law, and that's the subject of your course and uh, also the subject of this book that uh, Professor Blackett put together, um, which is the go-to uh, source on this question. Uh, so uh, just to talk a little bit about that, and uh, people used to talk about transnational labour law as being uh, something that, that was really limited to corporate initiatives or to the ILO conventions that people tended to, in many cases, routinely ignore, certainly in the case of the sort of company town scenario or the, the enclave that we've been talking about. However, the power to extend labour law across boundaries has been given new impetus, with, uh, particularly through trade agreements that have mentioned. Uh, so I'm thinking of the EU-Vietnam trade agreement, the EU-Canada uh, EU agreement that you'll know a lot more about than me, um, the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for a Transit Partnership, which involves both Canada and Australia, and also uh, Vietnam and many other countries in both Asia and Latin America. And these all refer to the ILO conventions. Uh, so uh, that seems to indicate a possible avenue for um, extending regulatory labour law regulation outside the boundaries of one particular state. But those particular initiatives are problematic. Um, and I think if you followed, uh, well, one issue if you followed Professor Blackett's work, you'd see that uh, you know, th there's a whole north-south issue there. Who gets to set the rules? Who gets to enforce them? Uh, my colleague has been looking a lot at the um, uh, trans-Pacific partnership arrangements would argue that their, their labour standards are, uh, their insistence on labour standards are unidirectional. They flow out of the north into the south and they're selective. Uh, so there's a lot of, I think, problems with that. Um, now, just assuming for the moment that those, um, that those international agreements uh, do do some good and uh, you can make some arguments for that effect, are they still premised on this uh, on a liberal sort of capitalist framework. Uh, and if we look at the approach that China's taking, uh, it's, it's coming at it from a quite different direction. Uh, and um, as Professor Zhou points out, it's structured around this idea of uh, what she's called state capitalism for, just to explain to you um, that earlier in, in the discussions. So there's current kind of tensions between the international regulatory order that's emerging out of these liberal capitalist traditions um, and state capitalist or uh, sort of versions. Uh, and one, one area of tension is around the idea of freedom of association. Now, um, that, that is sort of central to labor law projected in these, these trade agreements. Um, now, I think you can be very skeptical about real commitment to freedom of association and to collective autonomy. Uh, but nonetheless, that, that's there. Um, the, the, that idea is it's very much in tension with a state capitalism, uh, state capitalism for uh, which, uh, at least in its, its form, doesn't uh, it focuses instead on the state's ability to, live, to deliver uh, labour standards rather than um, necessarily empowering groups to self-organise. Uh, and so the question then is, well, uh, if China is more on the scene, what happens to that norm of, of freedom of association, uh, at least as an ideal, not in practice? 
Um, on the other hand, and, and this is a bit, um, uh, you know, this is this is the kind of pointy end of the discussion. So um, we might say ideally that mechanisms like collective bargaining or uh, workplace safety committees are a very useful way that that. Uh, workers and employers can, can co-regulate or uh, establish uh, norms that govern their own sort of situations. Um, but we see in practice that, that those mechanisms are often undermined. Um, it might be that to many workers and to many countries, the China's model, even though it's premised on state, is is, is in some ways more effective in delivering decent working conditions, and certainly within China. So also Singapore is another example of this, um, where you can use the kind of mechanisms that, that SSOs refer to, so um, very sophisticated technology, a powerful state, a basic party, those sort of things, to deliver, um, you know, in practical terms, uh, responses to problems like dispatch work. and. Professor Chen referred to the reforms in China, particularly in the 2000s, which I think have been seen, certainly relative to other countries, to be quite effective on the ground. Uh, so uh, the question then is, well, maybe that sort of approach may be attractive even uh, because it can sort of get things done um, from that point of view. Um, However, uh, I think there's also limitations. If, if, if you are committed to a kind of state capitalist for approach, um, it tends to require some almost uh, idiosyncratic or very specific conditions. As I mentioned, it requires a single-minded, powerful state um, like a, a Singapore or, or, or a China. Uh, and there's, you know, a lot of countries don't, don't, don't have that uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, in particular, states that can resist the pressure of global capital or, or uh, you know, accept it on, it, on their own terms. A second thing is, you know, dominant and pervasive political parties which uh, have strong methods uh, to rein in kleptocracy, again, both Singapore and, and, and the Chinese, um, and China offer examples of parties which are quite, you know, a very strong um, rules about corruption, and, and many political parties fall into that pretty easily. Um, and the other thing is access to cutting edge technology and the capacity to use it strategically that, that, that many of the professors those refer to. I mean, that again is a prerequisite that in many situations might not be there. So, my point is that if, even if you sort of went down the track and saying, well, what about a kind of state capital? Who model as an alternative um, then uh, to, to sort of the liberal capitalist models, and you still got these preconditions that may not be there. Um, and the last point I'd make is to say, um, as between, you know, on the one, one hand, the sort of Western or the Northern driven liberal capitalist sort of model on the one hand, and state the state capitalist model on the other, you still got an agency problem for the countries themselves, um, you know, whether it's Equatorial Guinea and so forth, how did they, uh, you know, where's their agency recognised and the agency of the people that work in them. So, anyway, that's all I wanted to say, uh, and uh, uh, the sun hasn't risen yet here, uh, but um, as, we, as we talk, uh, maybe we'll see this can come up some uh, in Australia. Okay. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. That was uh, very, very helpful and uh, thoughtful. Uh, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce C. Chen, who was selected by McGill to be the teaching fellow for this course, the Transnational Futures of International Labor Law. And I want to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, her uh, really stellar support. She's been a backbone uh, for the successful completion of this course. C. Chen is a doctoral candidate at the Faculty of Law at McGill. Her thesis uh, is focused on the implementation of international labor standards in the context of China's outward investment in southern Africa. 
prior to commencing her doctoral studies, uh, Si Chen obtained a Master of Philosophy in the Theory and Practice of Human Rights from the Faculty of Law of the University of Oslo. And along with her research experience, she has work experience uh, with a range of academic institutions. She's undertaken consultancies uh, and has worked with international organizations. And she interned with the Office of the United Nations High Commission for Human Rights in 2014 and worked as a consultant there in 2015. Since joining McGill, uh, si Chen has been an active member in the Faculty of Law. She has worked as a research assistant for several colleagues and at the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory. And she's organized important events uh, that have been to the benefit of the doctoral community as a whole. She's She's also been quite actively involved in our sister institution at uh, the Université de Montréal based Inter-University Research Centre on Globalization and Work, the CRIMPT, um, and has been a member of the Doctoral Student Coordinating Committee there. So it's a pleasure to welcome you here to offer some comments on the papers. Blackett uh, for organizing this panel and for inviting me. Um, it is truly my great honor to participate uh, in this panel. Um, and thanks so much uh, for the contributions by the three distinguished uh, scholars. I really enjoyed reading the two papers and listening to the presentations by uh, Dr. Mimi Zhou and Professor Yi Feng Chen. Uh, thanks also for Professor Zhang Kuni's uh, very insightful comments. Both of the two papers are um, indeed very informative and thought-provoking. Uh, inspired uh, by the two papers and also the two presentations, I hope to share uh, some of my understanding of two unresolved issues of transnational labor law. Um, the normative, uh, the, uh, I'll try to be brief uh, on the first point, and I will try to elaborate uh, a bit more on my uh, second point. The first uh, is the normative challenges of regulatory initiatives derived from different sides of law. And the second uh, is the driving forces for the e effectiveness of international labor standards in transnational settings. As, as we have heard from the uh, presentations and also uh, from the comments by Professor Cooney, um, um, both of the papers have um, address the normative challenges of regulatory initiatives. And Professor uh, Chen's paper illustrates enormous normative and regulatory challenges for existing normative regions. And Dr. Zhou's um, paper provided uh, an illustrative categorization of a range of Chinese regulatory documents issued by Chinese authorities at various levels, including uh, at ministerial level, industry and sector level, as well as specific instruments tailored for Chinese firms uh, op overseas operations. To me, those challenges are remaining puzzles which need to be further explored. For instance, in the context of Chinese outward investment, I have observed increasing cross-references between regulatory documents derived from different sides of law. And also the normativity of those documents as well as their practical functions are still unclear. And also as we heard from the presentations that indeed uh, the actual impacts of those regulatory measures as I quote from Dr. Zhou's paper, uh, they are so far appear to be mixed. And my second point um, is, a, is a pressing question inspired by the two papers um, which is on their interactions of the driving forces and their impacts on labor protection in transnational settings. To illustrate, I, I have three sub-questions. First, what are the driving forces for the effectiveness of international labor standards? Second, how, to, how do those actors with various driving forces interact with each other? Third, what kind of transnational legal orders have been formulated as a result of the interactions? In my opinion, the understanding of the dynamism of the interactions and their impacts is crucial since it depends our understanding about the potentials to make 
labor standards more effective for workers in transnational settings? While states are significant actors in transnational labor law, the implementation of international labor standards is not a sole result of unilateral efforts by states. Instead, it is emergent from the interactions among a set of state and non-state actors which have their respective driving powers in formulating transnational legal orders. This understanding is inspired by my research on China's outward investment in Africa, and it echoes with the conceptualization of transnational legal orders by Professor Terence Halliday and Professor Gregory Schaefer. Um, both of the papers have addressed the concern about driving forces, drawing insights from the influence of powerful states in transnational labor law. Dr. Zhou's paper stresses the important role of home states in, transna in regulating transnational corporations with respect to labor practices. Professor Chen's paper um, calls for setting, uh, stepping beyond traditional paradigm of national and international labor laws and dynamically enforcing international labor standards in transnational settings. He identified a number of actors with various driving forces such as transnational enterprises and the um, regional investment ar uh, uh, arrangements, et cetera. And also he points out the importance of the subjectivity of workers in international economic cooperation. My sub-questions um, on interactions of the driving forces and their impacts needs further exploration. They are surely not easy um, questions. And uh, I'm also still, uh, still looking for empirical clues to answer these questions. Fortunately, uh, the two papers have also um, offered some clues for the questions. Dr. Zhou's paper uh, introduces a document issued at the industry and sector level titled Guidelines for Social Responsibility of China's Outbound Mining Investments. Um, the, the issuance of the document provides an empirical example in which regulatory efforts by states were facilitated by driving forces in the transnational process. The document was issued by an industry association under the supervision of Chinese Ministry of Commerce. However, as we have um, observed from the text of the document, it is a result of combined efforts by Chinese governmental bodies industry associations, as well as the support from the OECD and some uh, international NGOs. And the case of Chinese posted workers introduced uh, by Professor Chen informs us that the actors in the process were expanded from Chinese posted workers versus their Chinese employers to the involvement of local government bodies and Chinese government bodies. The, the influence of the case did not stay within the particular case, but it led to, as I hope to quote uh, uh, from Professor Chen's paper, a reinforced regulation of posted workers, end of quote. So uh, as we have also heard, the reinforced regulation includes an urgent regulatory document issued by the Chinese Ministry of Commerce. In addition to revealing the various actors in the process, the case also provides us a specific example in which workers participate in the process and contribute to the formulation of transnational labor law. I also record a few other empirical examples contribute, contributed by scholars such as Professor Qin Quan Li and Professor Fang Li Cook. Their research work highlighted interactions among a set of state and non-state actors, including African local workers and communi uh, communities, and illustrated how the dynamic interactions of those actors may shape the labor practices of Chinese transnational corporations. The two papers are indeed very precious as they filled in crucial research gaps and provided insights for the remaining issues in transnational protection of workers. As both uh, papers uh, uh, stressed in the, uh, in the conclusion part, the remaining questions require theoretical and analytical 
framework and further in-depth in empirical research. I believe that conclusions of those two papers will be tested and enriched by the future research, particularly empirical research and case examples which are largely absent in the existing literature. I look forward to the future contributions by the distinguished speakers in, the, in today's panel, and I call for more researchers to participate in the discussion so that we could continue to address the remaining issues. Thank you so much. state capitalism the basic what neoliberalism becomes when, corp, uh, when, when totalitarianism uh, is basically the, the order of the day. Uh, and to that extent, should we celebrate or should we basically, should we be encouraged by whatever protections that the Chinese workers have when those protections come at the expense of, uh, of democratic rights, especially when we know that uh, that, that the Chinese state has detained a whole lot of Canadians, that the Chinese, st Chinese state is accused of neocolonialism, and that the BRI that you're talking about in the paper is basically an example or could be, could be argued as an example of neocolonialism. So to that extent, is state capitalism really a solution of neoliberalism or is it part of the problem? Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other questions at this point for the group of you? Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I have a question for Professor Chen. Uh, um, I noticed that you talk about something about the China's investment, bilateral investment agreement, and you mentioned that there is no labor provisions in the current over 100 IA signed by China. Um, but I, I know that over uh, the existing 3,000 IAs, there are some. There is a tendency that to incorporate uh, labor provisions in uh, in the in the future uh, agreement. So I'm one, I, I, I would like to know from your perspectives uh, whether China will follow these tendencies. If yes, um, in which kind of um, ways? Because uh, currently these uh, labor provisions have been kept characterized into three uh, three kinds. The, the non-lowering labor standards and the reference to international labor standards as well as corporate social responsibility. So what do you think the, the, the position that China would take? Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I, my question is directed at Professor Chen, but um, all of the speakers may have uh, may be able to, to answer it. Specifically, in reading your paper, and I really enjoyed both of the papers, and I was fascinated by the presentation. But reading your paper, you, you pointed to extraterritoriality as a, as a limit on the ability of China to control labor conditions in uh, the extraterritorial behavior of uh, Chinese firms outside the extraterritorial practice of Chinese firms. And I guess my, my question is very narrow, which is jurisdictionally, uh, practically, formally, 
what, what are the actual limits on the capacity of the Chinese state to control or influence or, the, or affect the labor standards, especially of, uh, in relationships between Chinese firms and Chinese workers, but to control labor conditions in its value chain? Um, what, what's, what's really stopping China from dictating what labor standards are going to be in, for example, the practice of a Chinese firm in Equatorial Guinea? Thank you. Okay, so we've got three yes, strong questions. Would like to start? Okay, all right. Yeah. Ladies first. Um, um, I think, yeah, thank you for, for a very um, thought-provoking question, which um, within um, the limits of my paper, I could not address because it raises, obviously, the concept I'm putting forward uh, raises a host of questions beyond just um, labor. But I, I do think um, Professor Cooney's um, comments about um, freedom of association uh, in the sort of construction of um, the architecture of international labor standards based on a kind of liberal capitalist um, notion of those standards uh, has been obviously um, a lot of problems for the Chinese state capitalism 4.0. Um, I've written extensively on this issue, um, so collective bargaining and uh, freedom of association in the context of China. I'm more than happy to refer you to that work. Um, the problem is that I, I don't think that I'm putting forward the argument uh, that state capitalism 4.0 uh, which is, I think, very specific to China. Um, uh, uh, Professor Cooney refers to Singapore as well. But I think, um, I think China does have particular characteristics. You mentioned the party. The party is not just a political party like, um, you know, the Liberal Party here or the uh, Labour Party in the UK um, or indeed the kind of parties that are underpinning, for example, Asian authoritarian regimes. The party in the Chinese context is very specific. I think it's um, that the party has, is the vanguard of the political uh, order and it's within that political order um, on which the Chinese constitution is based um, that the party um, is essentially, uh, it underpins everything in Chinese um, political and economic life. Uh, and so um, that's, that's an aspect of state capitalism 4.0 that I want to draw out that is very different from um, the uh, liberal capitalist economies uh, that practices um, neoliberalism. So I, I think I'm not presenting this as a um, better alternative normatively for um, you know, the law and development debate. I am just highlighting um, the particular characteristics of Chinese state capitalism um, 4.0 that obviously poses challenges to the current um, neoliberal paradigm. So state capitalism, you can, like, like I cited Chomsky's kind of um, description of the American government bailing out uh, these big companies and banks uh, during the financial crisis, he describes as a state capitalism. So, you know, I, th I agree with you. It could be that it, it is a symptom of neo-capitalism or the excesses um, of, of free market ideology that uh, requires state intervention um, at moments of crisis. Uh, but the state capitalism I'm talking about in China, the 4.0, is a different beast. Um, so... Um, I hope that sort of at least addresses some of your, um, I'm happy to discuss this a bit more, but um, I'm going to uh, perhaps, actually I'll turn to, I've got some comments about your question. Um, so I, I think for me, one of the drivers I have identified for the state to intervene, uh, for the party state to intervene in respect of um, trying to at least on paper affect some change with respect to labour standards of um, these post-it workers has been uh, sort of the image of um, really large state-owned enterprises. So the larger um, the state-owned enterprise is, like we're talking about the big like construction, the China construction, shipping companies, um, the, there seems to be much more efforts applied um, to, I guess these, you can call it soft law, but I think 
I also want to challenge the Chinese understanding of soft law. I think these political documents are more than just soft law. These are directions from the party. Okay? It's not the state, it's the party. Saying, because the party, as I highlighted in my um, uh, presentation, uh, really runs these large state-owned enterprises. So they might as well be called party state-owned enterprises. Okay? And that control, as I've highlighted under Xi Jinping of the party, in corporate China, China Inc. has strengthened. So um, I think when we talk about soft law in the, in the, in the context of these regulatory documents, um, it's more like political orders. Um, and, and, you know, the effect I have highlighted has been mixed, but it's very, very difficult uh, to do the sort of empirical work that um, uh, she has um, sort of uh, suggested because it's, it means you've got to get access to these uh, state-owned enterprises, and that's something I've been trying to work on. So, um, but yeah, turn it to you, Fern, to elaborate. No. Okay, thank you. So probably I shall first come to the, the third issue, third question. Uh, yes, I have, have suggested as the, the possibility about a certain extraterritorial kind of voluntary enforcement of certain Chinese regulation that would be a way how to protect those overseas property workers. But I think uh, there are two different levels when we come to this kind of thing. First, I think, uh, legally speaking, uh, or basically the, all the national labor laws would not ap apply extraterritorially in normal cases. So in principle, there will be a, a territorial principle behind uh, all the labor law. We still have the very much uh, sovereign, sovereign territory space imagination behind the re labor regulations. So I do not think, legally speaking, China would be able to enforce its labor law abroad. But definitely, I think uh, you could, could see many Chinese institutions, including the embassy officials, council officials, those management from the companies, and those Chinese workers, they try to invoke Chinese laws and try to invoke the contract they have been concluded and the Chinese law to make the discourse on how the situation could be properly dealt with. So I think there's two, the second level is actually there could be a de facto influence. The de facto influence, I would, uh, I would tend to agree with Mimi that uh, when it comes to state-owned companies, it would be much easier for them to abide by those norms and the regulations. And when it comes to private, private enterprise, it would be much, much more difficult. And in the case that I have studied, they, the holding company for this Jianyu company, it, has, it was a company that was privatized in 2005. So the privatization is also a very interesting and important phenom phenomenon in China after 2000. There are actually a large amount of private investment going to Africa. Not the, there are, of course, the state, big state-owned enterprises doing you know, infrastructure work. But if you look at the uh, very interesting phenomenon has been the private investment by private companies, individuals. And I think they are less bound by those normative framework. And this influence would be very difficult. Uh, yes, the question about the labor provisions in, invest in investment agreement. I, I think it's a very interesting and relevant issue for China to consider. China has China has also become a kind of important, quest, important state that invests largely outside of China, the second largest in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's become a very different for China now. China is still the largest country receives international foreign direct investment, but it also invests out, uh, abroad. So I think the investment treaty has been very much relevant for China. And I agree there will be many issues where if when we come to labor rights. For example, what kind of labor rights could be included? There's such a broad range of labor rights, but then what would be the core labor rights we really want to put them in the investment agreement consider they are relevant? The second would be what would be the benchmark or reference when we take these labor rights? And you have mentioned three different uh, models. I think they could all be relevant. And the last question is then how are we going to enforce those labor provisions? And as we're seeing already in the free trade arrangement, Many, in many cases, those labor rights are not really enforced through arbitration or dispute settlement mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they simply, simply call for conciliations mm -hmm. between the governments in order to mm -hmm. reach certain kind of 
agreement or settlement. So how to supervise those labor rights is another important matter. So to my understanding, I think China might at a certain point take the position to incorporate some labor rights, but this reference would be very general. And I do not see the possibility of a strong enforcement mechanism mm. through a very formalized legal language. And another issue, actually, I, I'm also a bit skeptical about the current arrangement of labor provision, either in investment agreement or free trade arrangement. One thing that, of course, as lawyers, we, we tend to encourage the incorporation of those labor provisions by those agreements. And we tend to, tend to think they, they address social dimensions or social concerns that we are having, and I think that they might provide some protection for social flaws in this globalized economy. But in another way, they could also create these risks. They could be simply kind of declaration mm -hmm. or declaration in order to make the free trade agreement or investment agreement acceptable mm -hmm. to many stakeholders. And this might actually not be a real solution. People tend to think if that agreement or, or with the labor provision, that problem is dealt with. No, this is simply a, another set of problem. Mm -hmm. And this also leads a risk about the frag I would call fragmentation of labor standards. Mm. And we see increasingly that labor standards formally in those settings are in a competition position with the labor standards formulated by the ILO. Mm. And the ILO, of course, tried to voice its effort to make a unitary kind of international labor standard and try to make itself a very authoritative mm. voice in, 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 uh, in certifying those labor rights. But uh, this is still, I a very li of limited use, I think. Mm -hmm. So there's also another risk when we're having the, that, these things. It might not be that easily good. It might easily look looking good, but how this would be functioning, I'm not that I'm not that confident. <laughs> and uh, coming back to the first question about state capitalism and non liberalism, I think it's a very interesting thing. And we tend to think that the labor regulation would be uh, 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 a very typical thing for a welfare state mm -hmm. and not a, a typical characteristic for a purely kind of non-liberal economic state. But still the matter is that when we have a state capitalism in, the, in a very important part of the globalized economy, and then how they would affect the labor rights in a broader structure. I'm a, I'm a bit different. Uh, I'm a bit different with uh, Dr. Mimito on this point. I do not think that the state has been that strong or that being that controlling because I think a lot of elements is still outside the government control, despite the effort made the government to by the government to control. And uh, if we look at an example that the way it comes to la labor rights, either collective labor rights or individual labor rights. It is a general experience that is reported by labor law scholars that those state-owned enterprises are doing better than private economic enterprises. Mm -hmm. So this also raises the issue, which, which would be the right, right way to interpret the nature and function of state capitalism, or whether this, whether this would be embedded, can labor in that embedded form of capitalism, or we want a deregulated private capitalism. Yeah. So these are very interesting things to reflect on. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kuni? Mm. Oh, yeah, just very quickly. Oh, and by the way, before I forget to say, uh, before I forget this, uh, to all the McGill students there, we love you in Melbourne, and if anyone wants to come on exchange, uh, <laughs> please, uh, please do so. Um, let me get back to the matter in hand. Um, so just to echo something that that, that uh, Ethan, the Professor Chan's just said about the trade agreements um, uh, and the, the kind of use of freedom of association in those agreements. Um, uh, just some... Um, I'll give you an example of something to think about. Like it looks, you know, for those people like me that you know have a normative commitment to freedom of association and to collective autonomy, um, it looks good when you put those things in, into the, the agreements. But um, as Professor Chen said, you can cast some doubt on them. And let me pose this uh, real situation to you. So there's an, a free trade agreement between the European Union and Vietnam. Now, um, 
Vietnam, for its own reasons, is examining freedom of association in its context, but certainly it's been pushed by the European Union. Um, now, the question is, could Vietnam go to Brussels or Estonia or Portugal and say, actually, I want to complain about your labour conditions and you're not enforcing? And, you know, when you put that to some, and I have, put that to some EU officials, they look aghast. And, and so that kind of unmasks a bit the kind of unidirectional or the kind of paternalistic approach that's been taken, which isn't really... You know, I mean, I don't have to agilize all about this much more than I do, but I just think this is a real situation um, that I've just witnessed in the last year. Uh, so that, I think, ties into what Professor Chen's saying. And it's something to think about when we, we say, you know, this is great, we've got all these labour protections in these agreements. I'm not saying they're useless, or, but I think that you have to look at them with a very great degree of caution. draw a, a few reflections, not really answers. Uh, firstly, it's about the, the, the actual impacts of the, those regulatory documents, yeah. as, as we previously um, agreed that it's really, for now, it's, it's still a puzzle and it's, it's difficult to, to research and to, to measure about. Um, um, but I would also, uh, again, raise the example of the guidelines on the outbound mining investments. I think as, I'm, uh, as, as we see from the text of the document, it involves more uh, international uh, actors and also it's, I think it raises more international awareness and I also I, I read a few uh, literature written by both Chinese scholars and uh, international scholars uh, who, has, uh, who have been uh, observing the process of the, the documents. I think maybe it's for the real in-depth empirical research, it's really still hard, but maybe we will have more information uh, during the implementation of those uh, regulatory documents. And another positive um, um, element I'm thinking, and also re um, received uh, uh, empirical examples from the existing literature that some of the, the uh, um, scholars have uh, researched about uh, the, the, how, what, what kind of factors are shaping the behavior of Chinese transnational corporations. And one of the, the reflections that is that um, when the giant or, say, um, huge uh, companies are taking some more positive measures, mm -hmm. um, the other, like, maybe smaller, yeah. uh, medium-sized companies will... Uh, and it, particularly in the Chinese context, I think there it, it's a... It's a more um, um, quick influence on those small and medium-sized companies to follow the um, pilots or say positive examples of what um, the giant companies are doing. So if we can work on that direction also, it can make some differences. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. Please, uh, well, before we thank our panel, I will just reflect on the fact that several of these discussions today around trade uh, will be, and calling into question the agreements, will be pursued next week in our panel. <laughs> nice. So thank you for whetting the appetite and really setting the stage on that. But thanks to our speakers, to our commentators for really a rich, uh, original, thought-provoking discussion. Uh, this will uh, be uh, enormously enriching as we think about uh, the future of transnational labor law. So please, uh, audience, join me to thank uh, our guests. And we have the opportunity to oh. have Emily Painter say a few words of formal thanks on behalf of the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory. Yes, so on behalf of uh, the Labor Law and Development Research Laboratory, the Truda Foundation, as well as the McGill University Faculty of Law, as Professor Blackett has mentioned, it, this was a very, very informative, very enriching um, session today. Uh, I think we all really appreciated your presentations. Thank you, for Pro Professor Cooney, from, uh, <laughs> for joining us so early this morning. And, uh, I'm really sorry I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as a small token of our appreciation, uh, I'd like you to accept these uh, very, very small gifts. Thank <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you so, so much.
now we'll pause for a 15 minute break. Uh, the refreshments are outside. And then class, registered class participants.